Previet. In the previous video, we introduced the problem that we will attempt to solve, which is building a control circuit for a serial adder. We also discussed the framework that will help guide us, the data path control model. In this video, we will apply this model to our problem by identifying specific components for each arrow. At the end of the process, we will have a table and flowchart that summarize the needed behavior of the control circuit. Keep in mind through all of this that we are confining the data path to the basic 4-bit serial ladder explored previously. There may be other useful features that we wish we could add, and we certainly could in another design. But for the sake of consistency, this data path circuit will not be changed. The first arrow of the data path control model we'll discuss is the input data. Where will it come from? Two 4-bit numbers are needed. With only one serial import available, these 8 bits must be passed in one bit at a time. It would be nice if the input data is locked into place at the start of the operation, rather than requiring those signals to be held constant. It is a dangerous thing to rely on outside sources of data to always remain in place. This is similar to a website that is not being updated and its links are broken. So we will use an 8-bit register as part of our control circuit. This register will clock in the given 8 bits at the start of operation and then load in those bits one at a time. This register will not be enabled to change until after the addition is complete. Next arrow. What will we do with the output data? In our serial ladder, a 5-bit sum is produced, counting the carryout bit. It would be helpful to hold this result for more than one clock cycle. Otherwise, it might be overwritten before the downstream users of the data are able to access it. To accomplish this, we'll include an output register. It would only need to be 5 bits, but a 5-bit register is not a manufactured device, so we'll use an 8-bit register. This register will be enabled to clock in the new data once the addition is complete, but then it won't be enabled to change until the following addition passes through several clock cycles later. Hmm, this brings up a question. How can we know that the addition process is complete? The bad news is that this adder does not include a status signal to tell us this. The good news is that each run of the serial adder requires exactly 12 clock cycles. Remember the table that we filled out. Therefore, we could use a counter to keep track of the number of clock cycles. Take a second to zoom out from this particular problem to look at the overarching design process. We started with a framework, the data path control model. We then asked a question about a specific piece of that framework. Our answer to that question evoked another question. In very complicated designs, this pattern of question-answer question could go on for several more rounds. Back to our problem. The next arrow to examine is status signals. A minute ago, we mentioned that there were no status signals in our given data path, this serial ladder. It would be very nice to have another output port that indicates at least if the final addition is complete, and maybe even if each phase of loading in the augend and addend is complete. This is a case of robbing Peter to pay Paul. We took the simple route within the data path, but that just causes more complications within the control circuit. We can work around the absence of a status signal, but it won't be easy. The next arrow is external signals. In this case, only one external signal is needed, a start signal. It sounds simple, but it's important. The machine would be useless if it added all the time or only at random selected times. The start signal should be activated only when the input data is ready to go. After that point, the start signal could be deactivated until we want to do another addition. Now for the final and trickiest arrow, the control signals, or the instructions that tell the data path exactly what it needs to do. I have identified four signals that we need to consider. Identifying these was not magic. I simply looked at the inputs to the serial ladder. 
Do we need to control the clock? No, not directly. In fact, there is this separate on-off switch we could consider later, so there is no need to ever tell the system clock it needs to slow down or pause for a while. This is usually the case with sequential circuits. Because the system clock is connected to many different devices, we don't want to modify it. Do we need to adjust this on-off signal? The answer is possibly. There is some flexibility in this design, or any design. Option A is to use the switch to pause the adder when it is not adding. Option B is to let the adder keep churning, but then clear it once we begin a new addition. Both of these options could be successful in addressing the issue that we don't want erroneous data within the registers at the start of a new addition operation. I have decided to go with option B. With this choice, it means we will not need to control the on-off switch, just leave it always on. It does mean that we need to control the asynchronous clear input. At the start of a new addition, this clear should be activated, but then left inactive for the remainder of the time. Note another common element of design. A decision on one component impacts other components. As much as we'd like to, we cannot consider each of these signals in their own little silos. We must understand the underlying circuit, in this case serial ladder, well enough to see how one component impacts the others. The final input to the serial ladder is the serial in. We need to control the flow of data from the 8-bit register mentioned earlier into this port. It must occur at the proper times, in the proper order. That covers the five arrows of the data path control model, but there is one big piece still missing, and this is vital for any sequential circuit. What states should we define? In past examples like the vending machines, it was easier to think of these as states. For example, state A means zero cents, state B means five cents, and so on. In this case, I think it is easier to think of these as modes, or the operations the adder should be performing. I have chosen three modes for this design. The first is idle mode, the time when the adder is just waiting around for a start signal. The second is load mode, the time when the aug end and add end are passed in to the register serially. The third is add mode. Once the numbers are in place, we add them together. Knowing these modes was only possible because of the work we did with the original serial adder and the tables. That prep work made clear the order of the phases and how long each phase took. Note that there is flexibility in these mode definitions. I could have split load mode into load augend and load add end separately, thus making four total modes. I could have also condensed load and add into a single mode since the behavior of the serial adder is actually the same in each. But these three modes are what I chose. These bullet points under each mode are important and will dictate what I write into the table on the next slide. They indicate what changes occur when leaving each mode. Idle mode will be ended once the start signal is activated and the mode will update to load. At this change, the adder must be cleared and the input data clocked into the input register. Load mode will be ended after eight clock cycles, and then the mode will update to add. At this change, there really are no clearing or other control changes necessary. Add mode will be ended after four clock cycles, and then the circuit goes back to idle mode. At this change, the completed sum must be clocked in to the output register. Back in idle mode, the cycle repeats and the circuit waits to start adding again. We have said quite a few words already in this video, and almost all of them are summarized in this one little next state table. The overall structure is similar to what we have seen before. There are sections for present state, present inputs, resulting next state, and outputs. The output signals are actually the instructions sent to the data path. They indicate exactly when the adder should be cleared, the output register should be loaded, and so on. 
let's look at each of the three modes. In idle mode, if the start signal remains low, the circuit simply remains in idle mode. It does not matter what the counter says. None of the control signals need to be activated. The circuit is just waiting. But once the start signal jumps high, the state will update to 01, indicating load mode. Upon this change, several control signals are activated. The counter is reset to zero. The input data is loaded into the input register. And both the adder register and the output register are cleared. Things are happening. Now in load mode, the circuit remains in load mode as long as the count stays under 7. Once the count reaches 7, the circuit is prepared to update. On that next clock edge, the state updates to 1-0 for add mode. Simultaneously, the counter is cleared back to 0. But why use a count of 7? Because 8 clock cycles are needed to load in the 8 bits, and the count begins at 0. Now in add mode, the circuit remains in add mode as long as the count stays under 3. That makes 4 total clock cycles. Once the count reaches 3, the circuit is prepared to update. On that next clock edge, the state updates to 00, zero for idle mode. At this change, the output register is loaded with the final 5-bit sum. The addition is complete. Notice how this table is a succinct summary of the whole process. We can also see the same information displayed as a flowchart. There really is nothing new here, so I won't repeat every step. But notice how the rectangles represent the various states, and the diamonds represent decisions to be made. For example, in idle mode, the decision maker is the value of the start signal. If start equals 0, remain in idle mode. If start equals 1, then update to load mode. Does this state change occur immediately? No, this will be a synchronous circuit, so the change will only occur on the clock edge. At that same edge, this box indicates what control signals must be activated. At the moment of change from idle to load, the input register is loaded and the count is reset, among other things. Personally, I prefer seeing the information in table form. Plenty of others prefer it in flowchart form. Both are commonly used, so you should experiment with both. Regardless, both forms succinctly summarize the whole process that the control circuitry must cycle through. But is it a circuit yet? No. We need to convert each of these operations into devices and wires. That will be the goal of the next video.